today on Dr. Phil. He was a 40-year-old virgin. He's got a wrecked car living in a parking lot. He says he's car camping. Well, I'm going to bed. I just recline the seat. You have food delivered to your car. Why not just go live at McDonald's? His sister says he's delusional. You got strawberry jelly and mouthwash and made hair gel. I have fruity hair. Is that what's in there now? A little bit, yes, sir. Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today's going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. who up until six months ago was a 40-year-old virgin, is currently living in a beat-up car that is held together with bungee cords and Gorilla Glue. He calls it car camping. His sister calls it delusional. My brother Mark has lived a life of destruction for 20 years. He's 41 and he lives in his car. Mark parks his car at the big box store in San Antonio, Texas. I call it urban camping. This is my shower bag. I keep my socks and my t-shirts right here. This is my handy wipes right here. This is essential for car camping. A few years ago, he was living in a storage unit. He's very immature, has that Peter Pan syndrome. My brother's always losing things. His wallet's been stolen twice. He's lost cell phones, glasses, keys. He trusts everyone. He's trusted homeless people, and then they've stolen from him. Mark got a job working for a rideshare company. He's had a few accidents. I later learned that he was driving with a suspended license. Mark will not take accountability for his actions. His excuse is, I have a great driving record. Progressive has rated me such and such. I feel like Mark takes advantage of my parents. They've bought him several cars. They've spent thousands of dollars on Mark. My brother is a Christian. Religion definitely makes him oblivious to the consequences of his own actions. He doesn't see the life of destruction that's his path. Okay, Jill, I'm glad you're here. You're concerned about him, right? Yes, sir. What's your concern? What's gonna happen bad if, let's, let's talk worst case scenario in your view. I'm concerned for his safety, his health, um, his well-being. Living in a car is not healthy. It's not something we ever envisioned growing up middle class. It's not safe. I mean, he's parking in parking lots, and they're dark, and he's out there like a bullseye shooting mm -hmm. target. That's not safe, right? Right. Mental health-wise, is it in his best interest? I mean, he's living in a small space and which by the way he doesn't own yes it's leased it's wrecked it's in bad condition yes it, it's in bad condition and so i'm thinking self-esteem wise he may put a spin on this but at some point doesn't he have to s pull that seat back up and look in that rear view mirror and say i'm 41 years old living in a broken down toyota I mean, we didn't know the condition of it. We didn't know it was this bad. I don't yeah. even know why he's still driving it. It looks like it's totaled, but um, it's... Yeah, I wouldn't want to, like, go a long way. He's proud yeah. of it. Yeah. He's proud of the car, now, even in the condition it's in. Well, I mean, it is. It does roll. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> True. <laughs> but um, you say he believes that if he prays and gives himself to God... He will be blessed with a dream wife, job, and children. Yes, he doesn't believe that it's working hard, being motivated, achieving your goals, setting goals. It's all about just what you, you and your relationship with God, you're going to wake up one day and your Pray life's going to God, gonna you'll be, have a family. Yes. Well, he's going to need like a turn. suburban or an SUV yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. for a, them all to live in, exactly. If, if he gets a family, right? Exactly. <laughs> What's he say when you challenge him on this? Oh, he says that I don't know what it's like to live on a single income because I'm married, and which I do live on a single income because I'm a stay-at-home mom, but <clears throat> he just says that I'm on my high horse and that I don't, I'm judgmental, that I don't understand how it is to live in poverty, and um, you know, that's not what we wish for him. We want his life to be better, but every advice 
all the tools we've given him, he doesn't listen. He just knows everything. Well, is he on the decline or is he in ascendancy? Because didn't, I don't know if this is better or worse, but didn't he used to live in a storage unit? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So is this better or worse? I would say worse because there was more room in the storage unit and he had right. a bathroom. <laughs> Okay, so the storage unit at least was in a building. Yes. Had and garage door type. It yeah, was one the of these you rent them storage units. Yeah, and the guy that worked there would leave the restrooms open. Because that was my first question, well, where do you go to the bathroom? And he said that the guy would leave the door unlocked throughout the night so that Mark could use it. So he had a relationship with the, the storage unit worker <laughs> that he could live in the storage unit until he brought his dog there. And then the dog was barking and the owner found out, or manager, and he was evicted from Where's it. Where's the dog now? Um, we put it to sleep because it had bone cancer and he couldn't afford to put him to sleep. So my husband and I paid for it so the okay. dog wouldn't suffer. So it was a humane thing to... Yes. To yes. Put he didn't need a dog to... when he didn't even have a place to live. Right, but the but... dog was ill. Yes. Why is he doing this? Because as I understand it, when he was young, um, he was really quite bright, right? right. Yeah. We figure that something kind of held him back in his adolescence. He experimented with drugs and alcohol. Um, we moved when he was in ninth grade, which was a very traumatic experience, according to him, because he wasn't able to make friends. He was bullied. Um, it's almost like he's stuck in his adolescent years and never grew up. That's why I said he has like Peter Pan syndrome. He's kind of just like a kid. In his, in his mind, it's like a fantasy world. But he was a bit of a prodigy early on. Like, wasn't he reading, yeah, like, he really reading early? he was reading when he was in kindergarten, and he was very smart and above his peers, and then I guess... Until just... third grade, he was doing really well, and then he kind of leveled off mm -hmm. at third grade. And then eighth grade, he had the problem when you moved. Yeah. Then he discovered marijuana in the 11th grade. Yes, sir. And then the wheels came off. Yeah. Yeah, he's okay, been in trouble so with the law. And... Whether it's correlation or cause and effect, at the time he discovered drugs, the wheels came off. Yes. That's when all progress stopped. Yes. So he was diagnosed as ADD and then he was on medication, but he was also doing drugs during that time, so we don't know if it ever really worked. Oh, I swear to God, this ADD. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we call a wastebasket diagnosis, yeah. by the way. He just doesn't focus. It's not yeah. ADD. He just doesn't yeah. have focus. <laughs> um, when I was growing up, this kid was a spoiled brat and needed to sit down and shut up. Now they're ADD. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it, and not to make complete light of that, there is an actual ADD, ADHD syndrome, and it is neurologically defined. It is very well documented, and there is a neurological profile that verifies whether you have that or not. Mm -hmm. Most of the general practitioners and some psychiatrists that start throwing Adderall and other type stimulants at kids don't bother to go through that. They just look at the behavior and go, oh, well, here, yeah. take this. And, and if you give that to someone who, by the way, happens to be on other drugs at the time, so you have no baseline, mm -hmm. you're just like throwing gas on a fire. Now, Jill says her brother is constantly using his religion as a scapegoat for what she calls his insane behavior. Now, we're going to find out what he has to say about that right after the break because he is here. He stayed in a real room last night with a bed and a shower and room service. And maybe it's inspired him. I don't know. We'll see when we come back. I am not homeless. I am car camping. This is where I keep my food supplies. I have my barbecue sauce, my mustard. When I'm going to bed, I just recline the seat. I have my pillow. I just get comfy on my right shoulder, and I'm good. I do everything everybody else does, just a little differently. And later, so you got strawberry jelly and mouthwash and made some hair gel. Yes, sir. Yes. Is that what's in there now? A little bit, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel like there's something wrong with my brother because of his mannerisms. Within five minutes of being around him, you'll notice he'll stare off into space. Kind of just, like, just 
He's in a fantasy land. He doesn't seem like he's in the reality that we are. Jill says her brother Mark is an immature, irresponsible, reckless 41-year-old man who lives in his beat-up, leased car that he used to drive as a rideshare driver. Uh, he even put his passengers at risk when the bungee cord uh, holding his hood down got loose and the hood just popped up on the freeway. Uh, needless to say, he lost that job. My sister says I'm homeless, but I'm not homeless. I'm car camping. I have been living in this particular parking lot since December of last year. This is the back seat and I keep my trash can there. I like looking stylish. This is my plastic wear. This is my shoe cabinet. This is my beach stuff. <laughs> During the summer, I go to the beach. This is where I keep my clothes. This is where I keep my food supplies. I can keep salads in my storage container. I have my barbecue sauce, my mustard. I do everything everybody else does, just a little differently. When I'm going to bed, I just recline the seat. I have my pillow. I just get comfy on my right shoulder and put my blanket over me if it's cold and I'm good. I leased this car through a rideshare lease program and I was a rideshare driver. I loved it. Unfortunately, in August, I had that mishap. Had a little accident. White pickup truck was coming from behind the dumpster wall and I slid into him. And that prohibited me from rideshare driving anymore. My insurance deductible is $1,000, and I just wasn't able to, to meet that. Now, this is a separate incident. I was behind an 18-wheeler, and all of a sudden, a pebble flew up and hit right here. I wake up at 8 a.m. every day. I give my thanks to God for the new day. I go inside and use the restroom. Everything I need is within three miles of each other. I am coming into my local health club where I do my showering. And this is where I come to do my laundry. It's a beautiful laundromat. And this is where I come to church Sunday mornings. They have free coffee. Who doesn't love free coffee? If I'm just not wanting to go through a drive through I'll order some food delivery. I have my Smokehouse Burger Meal here. It's a silver Toyota Corolla with the beat up hood. Doing good. Thank you so much. God bless you. Okay. Hot and fresh food and modern convenience. This is urban camping at its finest. I am a full functioning adult that just is trying to make it work. My family has been a bit hard on me. They have what I call have it all together syndrome. My sister is a little on the judgy side. She doesn't understand the struggle of, you know, paycheck to paycheck. What you said. Good to meet you. She didn't hear what you said? Oh, I said you're a little bit on the judgy side. Judgy yeah. side. A little okay. Bit. A little bit. Because I live normal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what is it that she's judging, and is it unfair judgment? Um, there's just a misunderstanding. Um, she, I have had a bad past. Um, I'm not going to deny What's that. What's the bad part of the past? Uh, drugs, just negative thinking, uh, lack of assertiveness in my life, and uh -huh. I'm, I'm rising up from that. Um, she doesn't see me every day to day. Okay, are you doing drugs now? Oh, absolutely not. No, sir. 2003 was the last time I smoked. How, how much do you trust your judgment? I'm making very good decisions Okay, now. you think you're making good decisions? It's now, Okay, yes. so In you trust past, your judgment. You, th you think you're making pretty rational decisions. Absolutely. I saw you in your car having food delivered to your car. I have done that, yes, sir. In a parking lot. I have done that, yes, sir. In a park, what are you, afraid you're going to lose your parking space? <laughs> I mean, you're no, in a sir. car. I... Oh, my God. Why not just go live at McDonald's? <laughs> and then you just walk in there and get it. Well, they have a good smokehouse burger that's only available through the Uber Eats program. It's not available on the regular menu. I'm pretty sure you can and... get it. And, and, some, and sometimes, you know, I get off work at 1 a.m. and sometimes the line's wrapped around the building, so I just go to my spot and just... Because you have money I like very that. rarely do that. You say you're innovative. Well, tell but them about the hair gel. You said you, you couldn't bring your own hair gel on the plane, so what did you do? Oh, wow. You told him about that. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it was just like two days ago. Well, I realized that two main ingredients in hair gel is alcohol and petroleum jelly. I didn't have 
petroleum jelly, and the only alcohol I had was the little mouthwash from the hotel. So I poured that in a cup and put some uh, grape, grape jam in there. No, strawberry jam, I'm sorry. Jelly, yeah, jelly. Fruity hair. I had fruity hair gel, and it, it held better. You see what we're working with? It held just as good as the LA looks I usually use when I'm at home. I just couldn't bring it on my carry-on. So you got strawberry jelly and mouthwash and made some hair gel. Yes, sir. Mixed a little water in it. He's creative. Is that what's in there now? A little bit, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey. It worked. Give me a little butter and toast, and we're ready to go. Uh, so you call this car camping, not homeless? Absolutely. To me, homeless is someone with no shelter at all. They're under a bridge. To me, that's fully homeless. I'm so blessed. So this is just kind of like a small mobile home. It is, exactly. It's a mobile home. Now, Jill says her mother, Mark, has never been able to financially support himself, and he is milking their parents out of thousands of dollars. Well, we're going to find out what their parents have to say about that, and we'll let Mark respond as well after the break. I want my mom to stop enabling him so that he does hit rock bottom. My wife and I have different opinions about helping Mark. He knows that mom is the money tree. We've probably given Mark $40,000 over the last 20 years. And later, we bought him hair gel. And, and it doesn't hold. My hair looks just as poofy five minutes later. You'd rather put something in your it hair yesterday. that attracts ants and flies and everything? <laughs> My mom enables my brother. I want my mom to stop enabling him so that he does hit rock bottom. His rock bottom is different than our rock bottom. My rock bottom would be living in a car. Well, Mark says his parents, Harv and Lynn, are always there for him and have given him thousands of dollars over the years to stay alive. But his sister, Jill, says Mark takes advantage of their parents because he knows their mother is an enabler who does not understand that Mark's problems have nothing to do with money. Now, Harv and Lynn say their son is an adolescent living in a 41-year-old man's body and treats them like a money tree. My son, Mark, is not living a life like a 41-year-old man. Mark is just like a hamster on a wheel, eking out a living. It worries me that Mark is sleeping in his car. It's very dangerous. Can you see that? Yeah, I see that. I ha had no idea it looked that bad. I used to send Mark care packages with food and cookies, but now there's no address to send it to. When Mark investigated this rideshare program, it was just a terrible idea, and it's one of Mark's crazy methods to get money. He has never taken any advice from his family. It's very frustrating. We have been helping Mark. We helped him pay off two of his credit cards, phone bills, electrical bills, attorney fees. We've given him several cars. My wife and I have different opinions about helping Mark. I'm more of a hardliner. He knows that mom is the money tree. One time, I found out he was sleeping in a lawn chair behind a building, and that just broke my heart. So we put him up in a motel. That was $700. We've probably given Mark $40,000 over the last 20 years. I just feel like Mark is not gonna learn by sending money. My greatest frustration is he just doesn't wanna make things better. Mark thinks that what he ought to be doing is going to Hawaii and living on the beach. He does not understand that only in movies do people do that. Okay, thank you all for being here. Do you believe that he is living to his potential? Absolutely not, no. What do you think is blocking him? His motivation. He doesn't okay. have any. Okay, so you think he just can't get it in gear. Right. What, mean, what do you think is keeping him where he is? Well, I, I heard your comments about ADD, and, and I have read about that. There's people that don't believe in it. and I'm concerned 
that he's killed off too many brain cells up there. By the way, I, and I don't want you or anyone to misunderstand me, I do believe in ADD and ADHD. I just think it is overdiagnosed mm -hmm. and overmedicated. So there can be neurological issues here. Uh, do you think you have a problem maintaining focus? I do, yes sir. Let's talk about motivation. Do you feel driven, I mean driven, to change your circumstance? I would say I, I'd like to think I, I am, but I'm not. Um, you want to be, but you aren't. I, I want, yes, I want to be, but I, I haven't found that yet. Okay, you know, my so. My dad was a go-getter. Jill was a go-getter. I, I haven't found that. I've never found But do that. you find that a positive thing? Do, to, would you think it positive to be motivated to set a goal and pursue it? I could. If I knew what I wanted to do, I, I could get after it and I could just go, go, go. I've maybe, got a lot going on in here that, that hasn't come to the surface yet. And maybe right. that's my fault. Do you think you've enabled him? That's what I've been told. I did make a list of things that I thought we might go over. Do you think you've enabled him? You think you've made it easier for him to not get it together? Well, I am an enabler. That's what I've been told. <laughs> I. Well, what do you think? <clears throat> well, I guess I am. Uh, we were giving Mark when he had his apartment about a hundred bucks a month, just for a little extra. Well, that's cash. not terrible. No. I mean, mother giving her kid a hundred bucks a month—that's not terrible. But I did make a list of things that I thought we might go <laughs> well, over. I, I have a number too. It's like forty thousand dollars. Yeah, because including s several cars. Here's a that. list I made. Okay. <laughs> You bought him beds, couches, microwaves, giving him four to five hundred dollars a month rent on ten different occasions. You've given him several hundred dollars for electric bills, sixty dollars for phone bills. You've written his resumes for him to get out and get jobs. Uh, you've paid for the title to get the Jeep back after he sold it. He had one car impounded and just never went to pick it up. $1,700 cashier's check to get a car that had been repossessed out of Hawk. $700 to live in a hotel for two weeks, paid off two credit cards, don't remember the amount, uh, and you've given him a total of about $40,000 in 20 years. That's about right. That's <laughs> about what I had figured. I do my homework. <laughs> I'm an enabler, right? I mean, we did this together. I mean, Harv agreed to all this. No, you no, did it in spite really. of. You did it in spite <laughs> no. of your husband, who's been in the background saying, are you nuts? Well, when he had his car repossessed. Um, well, let's not bog down in details here, because I don't really care about getting the car well, repossessed. I, I'm just asking. He had no place to stay. He still doesn't. He was, he was sleeping. She feels like he's safer in the car than on a chair in a parking lot. He was in a chair a behind a building. Car shelter. Right. And, and where is he now? He's in a wrecked Toyota in a parking lot ordering McDonald's to be delivered to his door. I know. How okay. would you like to have that 40 grand back right now? Yeah. Because be it hasn't nice. changed, right? No. You spent forty thousand dollars. What'd you get for your money? Same well, he's, he's he's right been, where he was. He's been when safe. He's... You know, a lot of it is keeping him safe. You're not off safe the living in a car. Well, it's not a shelter. I mean, he can. I'd rather it see him in an apartment than a car. <laughs> okay. I give you an example about his focus. You were, you know, it was sad listening to that about his hair gel that he made, but. What, last night or yesterday? We bought him a tube of hair gel. And, and it doesn't hold. <laughs> it looks just as poofy five minutes later. So he likes the homemade looks, stuff. My hair looks just as poofy five minutes later. So you, you'd, that, rather, you'd rather put something in your hair yesterday. that attracts ants and flies and everything? <laughs> I'm in a studio. I hope Dr. Phil doesn't have ants and flies in here. I don't think he does. I haven't seen any. Well, <laughs> even though Mark is living in his car, it is not preventing him from pursuing a love life on dating sites. Eleven, to be exact. We'll talk about that next.
he finally met the love of his life in Colombia. Uh, her feelings towards me changed when Jill intervened. I wrote her and told her you were living in a storage unit. Mark says he is on 11 different dating sites looking for a sweet-natured, family-oriented Christian woman. Now, he thought he finally met the love of his life in Colombia. He flew to South America, proposed and pledged his life to her. But his sister Jill says that she believes this woman never loved Mark and just used him for his money. Two years ago, my brother met a woman on a Colombian dating site. When I first saw her picture, I was like, she is a Colombian Taylor Swift. His behavior at that time was what my wife and I would call puppy love. She couldn't speak English, he couldn't speak Spanish, but he ran off to Colombia to go meet her. Colombia was awesome, I love Colombia. I met her family. She had three children, so he brought the kids gifts. At the time, he was still living in a storage unit. It scared the bejesus out of Lynn and me. We didn't know when he showed up to Columbia if he was gonna be catfished and held for ransom. Mark can't afford to keep up with his own bills, much less take on a wife and three kids. After he came back to the States, she broke it off with him. I gave her $580 out of my tax return. I don't think that she ever really loved and had any intentions of marrying my brother. He has not moved on. He still messages her. She has posted, please, Mark, stop harassing me. Do you think that she was using you? Absolutely not. What happened that caused her to break this off? A little bit of the language barrier, I think, didn't permit us. Like, I, I, knew, I knew basic Spanish, and she knew basic English kind of broken, but to have... Because y'all were going through Google Translating or something, yes, right? Sir. You'd type yeah, in and then Yeah, to have a translate. serious conversation. Yeah. yeah Mark, could... I think if the truth be known, you were getting too serious, and she was not looking for that. <clears throat> I think the feeling... if that If that were not the case, why would she have found someone in Texas already who contacted you asking you about her? I know she loved me in the beginning. I think As a friend, when, not a romantic. When I think the feelings faded. These are excerpts from her Facebook post between she and you. She says, please stop harassing me and my family. The situation is unbearable. This has become an obsession. I can't stand anymore. You say to her, I just want to hear the truth that you have had difficulty admitting that you also love me. She says, what love? I always offered you friendship, but you will never understand it. I think you need help and urgent prayer. That's why we're here. Leave me alone and my family. I see that my friendship and kindness was ill interpreted. I think she's saying that to justify cheating behind my back. She found, she found, she found the other guy while we were still together. Okay, well, okay, let's agree with that. And let's agree with yeah. that. But oh, still, you gotta the, close the, the door. point is, she says, leave me alone. She's moved on. And you have to move on, Mark. Well, he's on all these well as far as I know, I think they're broken up. Because she had lied to him. Her feelings towards me changed when Jill intervened and wrote her. Jill wrote her saying that I'll never be able to take care of a kid. You know, her kids, I'll never be able to take care of her. I wrote her and told her you were living in a storage unit. She knew that. And why is she knew the whole, spending his money she, to go to Columbia? She knew. He has nothing to offer you and your children. From, she needs to know the she, truth. She knew my whole situation. I Skyped her why would you from my phone if, from the storage why unit. Why would you she worry about exactly me telling her the same thing if she already knew that? Because why would you, you worry were putting about things it? in her head. If it was the truth, then how's that me putting anything in her head? She's saying, please, God, leave me alone. You, what do I have to do to get away from you? Or, what, what is up? What's the deal? Well, uh, the damage had been done by then. Well, but it's done. Yeah. Okay, let me rewind to the first questions I asked you when you came out here. I said, how are your problem recognition and problem solving skills? And you said, really good. And I said, you know, are you honest with yourself? Are you, do you see things clearly? And I think you're letting emotion cloud your logic here. This woman is not seeking a relationship with you. She's pleading. 
What's it take for you to accept that, that there's over. no future with her? That's hard to accept. That's really hard to accept. Well, do you, and she's not talking to you now. No, no, she doesn't respond, no. Well, we've been in touch with her. Do you want to know what she says now? That would probably provide closure. She's married. Well, she, li she lied about that when she first she broke up with that. me. She, she told me. She wasn't married then, she's married now. Yeah. Since she's talked to you last, she has gotten married. Is that closure now? Yes, that's closure. We're going to find out why Mark uh, says one weak moment took away something he was saving for marriage. We'll be right back. If I were a betting man, I would... <laughs> I would bet money that Mark has not been intimate with a woman. About six months ago, I did meet a woman online. I was just sitting in a parking lot, just kind of debating it. So I ended up getting the hotel, and I did lose my virginity to her. I had a weak moment, and ultimately, I, I caved. Well, Mark says he was feeling very lonely, so he went on a dating website for single parents where he claims he met a woman who told him to get a hotel room. In a moment of weakness, Mark says he had sex with her. He lost his virginity, which he was saving for marriage. Now, his family says instead of looking for love, Mark needs to get his life together. He's a very caring person. Right. But priorities you know, he, are he, not straight. He cares. He's trying to fix other people when he can't fix himself. Well, you had an apartment from 2002 until 2014 that you shared with a woman that was your roommate, but she had a boyfriend. I wouldn't call her, call him a boyfriend. He was just. <laughs> he, she, she had a boyfriend. Well, Mark. you moved her yeah, in. Boy, and, toy. <laughs> she had a baby. You helped take care of her baby. Yeah. <laughs> were, were you in love with her? I was. So you're housing her, he's sleeping with her, she has his baby, which you babysit. Mm -hmm. I thought that she would eventually love me if, if I showed that I was a good dad. That's but... a pattern. Okay, then she goes and you meet another woman, so she becomes a rent-paying roommate. Were you in love with her? She did help me. No. No, I, I saw good qualities in her, but I, no, I was not But you her. got kicked out of the apartment because she was having fights with her toxic boyfriend. Yes, sir. In your apartment. We had converted my dining room into her bedroom, and she was supposed to get her life together. And you got evicted in this first one because she attacked you and you ran out of the apartment naked and got evicted. That was the first roommate. Right. So your relationship <laughs> skills are perhaps lacking. In the past, I have made some bad decisions with my acquaintances, but I, I have learned my lesson on that. You've got a profile up on a dating site now, a Mexican dating site, and about me, you say home type, um, other, nationality, United States, languages spoken, English, Spanish. I'm looking for uh, who wants to have babies with me and Whoa. to form a happy family together forever. Oh, my God. Wow. Where'd that come from? <laughs> that's, that's your goal? Eventually. We need your help. Well, Jill says she wants to know how to get Mark to stop being so delusional and actually see the reality of what's going on in his life. His dad says, well, has he burned up so many cells that this really is just not realistic for him? Does he need to be in some kind of structured environment or whatever? Going to address all of that when we come back. Now, your dad asked, is it possible that because of the drugs that you've done, did it leave some lasting damage to your brain? Look, the brain has what we call 
neuroplasticity. There's a lot of neuroplasticity. With help, the brain can recover. Without help, it remains in a static position. Parts of the brain go dark, they remain dark, and, and unless you do affirmative things to wake up parts of the brain that have been damaged, then you're not going to have an increase in functioning. What we do know is once you start doing drugs, your emotional development is arrested at that point. So you, ha you, do, you said we have a 17-year-old, we have an adolescent, a 41-year-old body. You're exactly right. Emotionally, his evolution stopped when he started doing drugs. Now, I want to add someone to the conversation. This is Coach Mike Baer. He is a life coach who is respected by his clients, and he has helped them get and keep their lives on track. Now, Coach Mike focuses on helping his clients break free of their destructive patterns. And he has a new book called Best Self, Be You Only Better. And let me tell you, I consider this book to be a how-to manual to maximize your potential by discovering the best person that you can be. Coach Mike is the director of an organization called Cast Centers. And one of the things they provide is a life coaching service. Now, Coach Mike, you can provide coaching for this gentleman. You can provide coaching for Mark to change his lifestyle and get him back in the game, can you not? We can do that. And, and Mark, it's about how do we work together to create a structure, accountability, and to work with you, not tell you what to do, but work with you to devise a plan to improve your life that you deserve, if, if you're willing to really dig in and do it. I am. Amen. Fair enough? Fair enough? Okay. Special thanks to Mike Baer, uh, Coach Mike, and Cast Centers. And I'm going to have a link to Cast Centers. Uh, Cast Centers provides these coaching services. They also provide uh, PHP programs, so like partial hospitalization programs, intensive outpatient programs uh, for uh, drug rehabilitation. There's all kinds of programs there. Mike directs these things. And uh, we're going to give you the absolute best of the best. So we'll see you next time. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much.